on wide range, uh, wide ranging life from you know uh, ethics in uh, bioscience business, improving the organizational efficiency in bio life, uh, life sciences uh, organizations. Uh, you know, you name it, it's really wide. We have a person who is a, really a versatile person amidst us here to give this lecture. We are very fortunate to have him here. He has published more than half a dozen books, and he has published uh, the number of journals. I couldn't uh, keep track of the numbers. More than 40, 50 uh, journals, uh, articles, what he has published in various international journals. He has been cited by many researchers in their researches. He has been a referee for many of the journals for selecting entries. You know, his achievements go on. There's no end. So I'm very, we are very happy to have you here with us, sir. As I told you, I will try doing injustice. Sir. Whatever I say, it will still not be sufficient to, uh, you know, introduce you sufficiently to the audience. But I welcome you for this uh, day, sir. I really look forward to it. Uh, may I request uh, Harika to give a... We have a Mr. A chief guest, uh, I don't think, I think if any of you were to guess his age, all of you would be making a mistake. He's a very young IAS officer. Mr. Bawar Lal, he's right now, he's uh, a principal secretary, Department of Labor, Employment, Training, in fact, he's government of Andhra Pradesh. He's an 83 batch IAS officer. He has held many positions in the government of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, you know, he has been a secret, uh, secretary, he has been a uh, collector, he has done various postings he has held. Before he went to, as I understand from him, it was not part of the uh, city, what he saw, but taking this current posting. So he is right now a principal secretary in the Department of Labor, Labor Relations. Uh, it's very apt that he is here today when our, uh, our visitor, our, our, our keynote speaker is going to speak on skills, jobs in the global economy. We're talking about skills, the gap, the skill gaps, and it's very, very uh, apt that we have a NIAS officer who heads the Department of Labor. We welcome you, sir, for this uh, function. So, go on, sir. We also have a minister, he's here before. And he was here in Hyderabad till recently, and he has recently been transferred to State Bank of Indore, the Chief General Manager there. Mr. Lal has been in the banking sector for the past 35 years, 35 long years. He joined uh, way back in 74 uh, as a professional officer, and he has held various positions in various banks, mostly associated banks, so associated banks of SBI. And uh, before he went to Indore, he was the general manager and then uh, subsequently the chief general manager of the State Bank of Hyderabad in Hyderabad. He has been just been transferred there and he also has a wide experience in various fields of banking. You know? Banking and left. Once of you are talking about a person who has 35 years of experience in banking, we are talking about some experience. So we have a set of three people here. I think we are very lucky to have them here and we are going to be very lucky to listen to them and uh, share their views with us. We thank you very much, all of you, sir. So, uh, we welcome you, Mr. Lal, to this function. And we are sure that uh, the final uh, half of session, what we are going to have. I welcome you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Feinbold will give his distinguished uh, lecture, please. Great honor to be with you today at one of India's top institutions for research and teaching in uh, public enterprises. I've enjoyed my time here uh, with Professor Mishra and the faculty greatly, and am very impressed by uh, the growth and the dynamism, and, and also anxious to see if there are ways in which we might be able to cooperate between our two institutions. Instead, that this will be a, a two-way dialogue, a chance for us both to learn, because my primary reason to be in India is to conduct my own research as a new project that is comparing the skill system in India and China. And so I am going to share with you some very preliminary findings based on what we have been learning and very much hope that through your questions and comments that we may be able to shape and improve this project. And so um, I, I, I encourage you to be active and, and, and to show your views. 
And as I mentioned, the other purpose of the talk will be to give you a very brief overview of Rutgers and my school, my own work, just so that we might explore potential areas where we could partner. So Rutgers is an unusual university, first founded back in the 17th city of New Jersey, which it became in 1950. It has three campuses across the state of New Jersey in the north, in the center, and in the south, and the U.S. that has the top designation, the public AAU universities, which are the top research universities in the country. We've had a couple of Nobel Prize winners, Milton Friedman, who you may know, the famous economist, was an undergraduate there, and Salman Waxman, who discovered the first antibiotic um, to be used commercially during World War II, was also a, a scientist at Rutgers. It's also, I think, a, a, a very convenient place for uh, Indians uh, to come because next to us in Edison is the greatest concentration of Indian population in all of the U.S. So we have a very vibrant uh, Indian community there and building closer and closer ties. Today, nearly 3,000 faculty. It's a very research active institution with more than $300 million of research each year in a very wide range of disciplines and just listed are some of the top brand programs in disciplines ranging from philosophy and mathematics to biotechnology and the school that I run in management and labor relations. I arrived at Rutgers three years ago and one of the first things that I did is to launch this new degree program which is, is quite new across the whole US. There are about a hundred of these now, most of them quite small in one or two departments. I have been involved in California in creating this new kind of education, a professional science master's degree that is seen as vital to the competitiveness of the U.S. economy. Because as India, as China, as the U.S. all focus more on innovation, we need to develop people who understand both technology and science and business. And this is a degree that seeks to integrate those two. In fact, the student's final project is to take a real technology from a lab at Rutgers, or that they have developed, or one of our partner institutions, and to write a business plan for that, and present it to investors, so that they might, at the end of the program, create their own jobs, as they create a new technology to license, or to create a startup company. We have already raised more than $2 million from different federal agencies and foundations to launch this program, and it will be starting this coming year. And from my discussions, I think this could be a very good potential fit, given the Institute's emphasis on things like biotechnology, as well as obviously on the management side. So the school I run, the School of Management and Labor Relations, is a bit unusual in the U.S. context. So you all know of many, many business schools, and Rutgers has two business schools at different campuses. But ours is a school that focuses only on the people side of organizations. So we have two departments, HR and Labor Relations, with about 30 faculty among the very best in the world in their different fields, and they all focus in one aspect or another on things that are directly relevant to helping organizations better manage their talent. Though we are quite a small school, we have a wide range of programs, undergraduate, masters, PhD, a lot of executive education, and some leading research centers in areas like human resource strategy, and also women at work, and looking at how to enhance the opportunities there. These are just some of the areas where we have world-leading scholars. It's possible in some of your courses like HR or organization behavior, you will actually be reading the textbooks that these scholars have written. Um, I've talked to a number of faculty here who are interested in rewards, compensation, performance management. We have some of the very best there, also in things like global leadership development, how to manage diversity, and then the of organization. Likewise, on the labor studies side, we cover a wide range of topics looking both at formal unionized settings, but also new forms of representing worker interests, the impact of globalization, looking at issues around building inclusive organizations, helping disadvantaged groups gain in the labor market, and also looking at, as you do here, the public policy context that shapes the employment relationship. Can you go back? So these are just some of the books that our faculty have written, people like Mark Huslin, president of the Academy of Management globally, some of the top scholars in the world in their different fields with a very global outlook and very interested. In
you have already heard in, in the excellent introduction some of my research interests. I, I won't go back over them in detail, but if you are interested in any of these areas, I would be happy to, to talk more with you in question time. One of the things that I'm working on currently is, is a new book on the question of sustainable capitalism and looking at how it is that we may develop new models for creating value that are alternatives to the traditional for-profit public corporation. But the, the main focus for my research here is looking at the, the area which has been the greatest concentration of my own research, namely skills and economic performance. And so I started this work when I was in England as a graduate student, where actually the situation was not so dissimilar from where India is today. When I arrived in England, about 10% of the population went to higher education, and most of the rest of the population, the majority, left school at 16 and got no further education or training. The prevailing wisdom at the time was that the reason for this was the working class and the fact that they were not interested in further education and training. So like you might hear say, it's a problem of the caste system. There they were saying, it's a class issue. And I said, this is not true. That actually, if you analyze this as an economist and you look at the way the system is structured and the incentives for individuals, they're behaving very rationally. And if you change the system, if you change the examinations, if you change the incentives for universities, if you change things within the labor market, you can change the system. And this has happened. So within one generation, Britain went from 10% in higher education to today, Britain has more people getting a degree as a percentage of the population than the US, which was the world leader. And so what I am interested in studying is, could India do something similar? Could it make that kind of leap? And what would be required to do it? We have looked at self-sustaining, what I call high-skill ecosystems. Areas like Hyderabad in the high-tech city, or Silicon Valley, or Bangalore, or Singapore, where they have developed dense clusters of highly paid, highly research-intensive knowledge work, and use this as a way to develop wealth and uh, to be successful. This notion of clusters or high-skill ecosystems, we've tried to identify what are the key success factors that might allow us to build more of these in different nations. These are some of the books that I have done and had the privilege to work with a number of governments around the world in applying the research to help them improve their education and training systems. So now, looking at how the world of work is changing and what does that mean for the skill system both in the US and in India and China. The world of work. You will be very well aware of them, I'm sure. Globalization, technological change, major demographic forces at work, as well as the growing recognition of the need for sustainability, as your own Prime Minister has pointed to, in thinking about models of both growing wealth, but doing it in a way that will make for a better plan. These have major implications for workers. So it's fairly clear that if you want to succeed in the global economy today, that education and training skills are absolutely vital. To, to build a good standard of living, but they are not sufficient. As you know, here in India, and we experience in the US, the rate of graduate unemployment is quite high and potentially growing. We used to say in the US, if you got a college degree, you were set for life. You would have a good job, a good career, a good family. This is no longer the case. Many of the jobs that our college graduates got are the jobs that are actually easiest to now do in India for about a quarter of the price. So if our graduates are not focusing on something that is really differentiated, that is adding a great deal of value, their work is threatened. And the concern about offshoring and about the movement of jobs has been greatly magnified in the US by the severity of the current economic crisis. While there have been some encouraging signs in the last few weeks, still the unemployment rate in the US will cross 10% of our whole economy in the next few months because it will recover slower than the rest of the economy. And that greatly underestimates the scale of unemployment, because it does not count those who are so discouraged from looking for work that they don't apply for unemployment benefits. And it also does not count those who would like a full-time job, but are only able to find part-time or temporary work. If you count all of that, that number about doubles. 
But no, we have, unfortunately for the U.S., a broader structural issue, which is pointed to by Alan Greenspan, who was the head of our Federal Reserve at the time that led to the policies that have since undermined the global financial system. Just one small error, right? He said, I thought that the market would self-correct, that people's own self-interest would stop them from abusing the system. But unfortunately, that was wrong. In fact, our compensation systems and the incentives for people to abuse the system were huge and this. And so India now is in a much more fortunate position because your head of the Reserve Bank and your head of finance did not allow things like some of these new financial instruments and derivatives. And so you have not had the same consequences, still some, but not the same effect from the global economic crisis. There is around globalization. About one quarter of our manufacturing jobs have left the U.S. or have been eliminated altogether. And this has been accelerated in the crisis because of the, particularly the crisis in the auto industry. Two of our remaining three auto companies have gone bankrupt and are now emerging from bankruptcy as much smaller Unusual that even some very prominent economists in the U.S. are starting to look at is free trade a truly good thing? Now they would all agree that we don't want protectionism, that overall the pie will be bigger if we have the free flow of goods and services. The question is who will be the winners and the losers in that free flow? And there is no guarantee that most workers in the U.S. will be winners from that. In fact, the trends over the last few decades show that while there has been a huge increase in wealth for the very top of the economy, that most American workers have actually not benefited at all from globalization and the workforce. And we have, in effect, what people call the barbell economy, a growing at the top and a growth at the bottom. And so for me, you guys may, may see here today, I'm traveling on this trip with my son, Sam who is 16 years old. He's just now thinking about going to university like you all have done. And I have to think about for him and for the generation of his friends and what, what is the career advice we give them. Part of why I wanted to bring him to India was to see firsthand the changes that are happening in the global economy, the growing competition that Americans will face, and to understand that it's truly important to identify an area which you are passionate about and where you can make a difference.